without further ado, I do welcome you here on behalf of the Passau University and uh, announce this uh, second day opened. We are here on behalf of um, the Vigo International Training Network, which is kindly funded by the European Union here at the University of Passau. And um, this is a, the, actually the first event of a series of feminist political ecology dialogues happening all over Europe over the next month. And I'm very happy to welcome you here to our very concern about rethinking food here in Passau. And for this, we are together here to um, share about Vigo project, what is feminist political ecology, and discuss with you um, the wider meaning and also the consequences of that. Yesterday, we started off with a wonderful keynote speech by Pater Terani Kröner from Humboldt University, who enlightened us on the concept of meal cultures, taking the idea of food forward by enlarging it to move beyond the so-called farm gate, but look into the processes of preparing, consuming, and the social significance of that. And with this, I think she very much um, opened the wider space of rethinking food by moving beyond nutrition, beyond production, but really think um, in a holistic way of we and production as one and the same. And I think this was a very interesting um, thought provoking talk to really open the black box of how is food actually, how does it come to our table? How do we actually also consume and enjoy it? And um, I hope in this spirit, we will also continue to discuss today's research findings from, Vigo, from the Vigo project. What is Vigo? As I mentioned, it's a European-wide network and also with many partners worldwide, uh, training 15 gifted young scholars in um, well-being, ecology, gender, and community. What do we do? We link researchers, communities, and policymakers for a productive interaction um, in our research. So we work in an interdisciplinary fashion, in a way also intergenerational to carry on um, feminist insights and in a very, very international setup. Um, so we very much focus on place-based processes of knowledge making and mutual learning among researchers and communities. And um, it is this kind of co-production that enables us to map out strategies, how to make communities resilience and sustainable, whatever that means. So also we need to be aware of um, the many meanings of this concept. At the heart of we go are gendered power relations that shape access and control of, yeah, human nature relations in very specific contexts. And therefore we look at topical areas to actually work at the case of climate change, extractivism, struggles over food and water, but also commoning community economies and the politics of care. And last but not least, uh, very close to our methodological is the analysis of communities' everyday lives and also the emotional and sensual and social relations to natural and cultural, so the nature culture of so-called resources. And we sort of try to um, yeah, provoke around these. Um, these frameworks. So we conduct this with a feminist political ecology perspective as a framework of analysis. What does that mean? So FP FPE is very much an approach which places power center stage. It critiques the dominant scientific games and it engages in the ongoing debate about social nature relations and 
also the more than human connections. So as Amherst framed it, FPE is a process of doing environmentalism, justice and feminism differently. So we are committed to feminist epistemologies, methods and values. And we give emphasis to research and practice that hopefully empowers and promotes social and ecological transformation for women and other marginalized groups. Nevertheless, we are aware that this requires critical reflection of method, positionality and situatedness. So um, this um, also we embrace also the dilemmas um, which are part and parcel of the productive process of co-producing knowledge. We further examine the basis of power and knowledge in gender relations and we very much draw on the experiences and knowledge arising from the struggles for justice in local communities. So we value activist um, knowledge and try to um, create a um, um, fruitful discussion and this is also part and parcel of the process, this FPE dialogue. Yeah, and last but not least, um, FPE very much um, is convinced that body, na gender, nature and society are interrelated and constitute each other. So this is in a nutshell, but you will much more learn from the cases of young researchers in the next, um, yeah, maybe two hours to um, what actually FPE means in practice. Now, why are we here focusing on a dialogue about alternative food practices? Well, we are convinced that we can demonstrate how to grow and consume food differently. So there are practices already in place which can open the way and maybe also our imagination to um, growing food differently. So, but this is not innocent, but we need to explore the power structures in these eating relations. So all in all with our inputs and these little insights into our work and our working relations, we want to provoke and encourage um, this dialogue by sharing this alternative alternative food practices from all over the world. And we're really glad to bring in the knowledge from India, from Indonesia to our little university here in Passau. And of course, from Berlin, um, our local um, capital. So all in all, we want to show the very intimate relationship between food, social relations and our environment as yesterday part to demonstrate it in meal cultures but very much in the everyday life and the alive and kicking food alternatives, which are abound and uh, can teach us, um, yeah, many lessons. So here we are um, about to start with our second day content wise, and I'm very proud to um, hand over um, to Professor Dr. Gulai Chagla from the Free University in Berlin a fellow most dear um, member of v the Vigo network to host, uh, to chair this um, upcoming presentations. Um, Gülay is, holds the chair of gender and diversity at the Free University in Berlin. And she has been all, also a um, professor on gender postcolonial studies at the Goethe University in Frankfurt she looks back on a career and studies in um, political science in Kassel, Swansea, and Frankfurt. She has worked ex extensively on feminist theory, gender studies, international political economy, and of course, feminist political economy. And she's also related to um, the project Pato yesterday briefly um, presented um, the diversifying food systems in Eastern Africa. So I'm very happy to have her here to lead us with a, a very sophisticated and well-informed um, eye for food alternatives through this exciting 
afternoon here in Zoom at the University in Passau. Dear Gülay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martina, for the introduction and for also for the warm welcome. Also a very warm welcome from my side. I'm thrilled to be here, uh, to be part of the feminist political ecology dialogues today at the University of Passau. I would have loved to be there personally, but uh, virtually is also beautiful. Uh, to see you all here. And it's uh, my task today to facilitate this event, the discussion, and to bring you smoothly through the day. We will proceed as follows today. Uh, I will briefly introduce to you the panelists of the round table. Uh, and afterwards, we will have a short statement of maximum 10 minutes by each panelist on the round table. We will then have a second round of uh, comments in which we will be basically discussing two questions which revolve around the notion of alternatives. So what are actually the meanings of alternatives and what are the challenges of inclusivity in alternatives, alternative food systems? After that, I will open the floor for questions and comments from your side, from the audience. And um, yeah, so this is the plan for today. And um, before I forget, I would ask everyone to speak slowly. It's um, I'm telling you, but actually I'm the one who speaks pretty quick normally. So I hope it's slow enough the way how I talk. And uh, so I would like to ask you to do so because the interpreters um, do have the hard job of translating uh, all the content, which is which I would also like to thank a lot for for this. Uh, it's 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 not easy, I can imagine. So let me briefly introduce to you um, the panelists, and I got uh, the following order. Um, so I would like to start with Marlene uh, Gomez Becerra, who is an early stage researcher at the Vigo ITN network. Her research topic is entitled The Politics of Food in Community Kitchens, the Case of Berlin and Barcelona. She is based at Freie Universität Berlin uh, with me. And um, Malena is actually from Mexico and she is a political geographer. She studied and also worked as a research assistant at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She is interested in topics such as decolonial and postcolonial studies, space and gender, and solidarity economy. And before joining, Vigo, her um, research focused on the study of peasant and indigenous communities in Mexico that seek to build an alternative way of life based on gender equality, good living, buen vivir, and decommodification of nature. Welcome, Marlene. The second panelist is Siti Maimuna. Uh, she's also an early uh, stage researcher at the Vigo ITN network, and she's based at the University of Passau. Her research topic is entitled Reclaiming the Frontiers, the differences Adat, gender, and intersectionality make for resource frontiers in central Kami uh, Kalimantan, Indonesia. Siti Maimuna is from Jemba, East Java, where she also studied soil agriculture at Jemba University. She started her career in 2000 with Jatam with a mining advocacy network, where she has also developed her knowledge about women and mining issues. And later, before joining Vigo, she became a researcher at Sajogyo Institute, focusing on agrarian issues, where she also published a lot of scientific and also journalistic articles. Welcome, Mai. Very happy to have you here. The third panelist is Enid Still, who is also an early stage researcher at ITN and based at the University of Passau. Her research is entitled Landscapes of History in Tamil Nadu, a study of colonial continuities in agricultural relations. 
after her BA at Glasgow Caledonian University, Enid spent several years of working in arts management in the UK and India before she completed her master's degree in social anthropology in Oxford University. As a research scholar at Savitribai Pulipuna University in India, she became involved in advocacy research, developing an interest in political ecology and anthropological critique of development and growth. She is interested in contributing to the emerging field of FPE and exploring on how community economies, agrobiodiversity and a sense of belonging are negotiated in Tamil Nadu. Welcome, Enid. Very nice to have you here. And now the last panelists are two, also based at the University of um, Passau, with um, um, Patrick Kalbart and Dimas V. Laxmana. Um, they are at the chair of Professor Padmanapan and uh, members of the project Int Organic. Um, Patrick Kalbart is a postdoc researcher. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Kalbart is the postdoc research fellow in the project Int Organic. He seeks to shed light on the social cultural context of organic agriculture in Indonesia by investigating uh, um, the principles of local, local organic farming practices and disclosing the ideas, values, and aspirations associated with such practices. And Dimas is a PhD scholar at this project, and she explores the institution of organic farming, which touches upon the issues of government regulations and policies, and how these rules interact with various stakeholders along the value chain of organic products. So this is our very exciting panel. And I would like and uh, now like to give the floor uh, to the first presenter, Malena. And um, as you maybe um, noticed, I got uh, quicker and quicker when talking. So I remind you again to talk slowly uh, for the interpreters. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. 10 minutes maximum. I will be strict, OK? Thank you very much, Kula, for this wonderful presentation. And also, Martina, for introducing the, uh, the event and the WeGo Network. So Cleo, could you please share? Thank you very much. Yeah, so hello everyone. Thank you very much for being here. As Gula, Gula said, um, my name is Marlene Gomez and I am currently writing my PhD on practices of commoning within community kitchens. And I am focusing on the analysis of food provisioning as a practice of governance, care and solidarity economy. And I forgot to speak slow. <laughs> So next slide, please. Um, yeah, today I would like to draw on the question, how are practices of commoning articulated in practices of food provisioning in spaces like community kitchens or food sharing networks? And my, ca my case study is in the city of Berlin. Um, in the attempt of understanding commoning from a broader perspective beyond community governance of woods, I retrieve a feminist political ecology perspective that allows me to understand commoning as a contentious practice across species, meaning that each practice of commoning that we perform involves also the agency of more than human subjects, a topic I won't talk today about, but I will talk about food so, and commoning. So um, thus, Commoning is a practice entangled in a socio-nature network that creates domination, conflict, and exploitation, and it's embedded in negotiations, relations of power, and intersectionality. From this perspective, um, I can understand food as more than a commodity, immersed in both private and community power relations. FP allows me to understand how flows of food maintain material and immaterial interaction. And this means that food is relational to humans and to territories, and it manifests across multiple spaces and scales. Food has meaning, and we cannot detach it from that. Otherwise, it becomes just a commodity. Next slide, please. My presentation will have the following order. I will present some testimonies 
And afterwards, I will put some questions on the table so that we can discuss them later. So uh, first testimony. Every Wednesday at the Gentestrasse in the north of the lead in Wedding, around 4 p.m., the food savers of the food sharing movement arrive. Three men and a woman bring boxes of vegetables and fruits, all collected from supermarkets, the street markets, and small grocery stores. The food sharing movement is an initiative dedicated to rescuing food that by law is no longer accepted for sale because it doesn't match quality standards. This network seeks to, ma to make the most of food while it is still edible. I was there last winter to interview the food savers. And I asked one of them, who is also an organizer within the network, what motivates you to rescue food? And she says, food waste in this city is immense. Everything we save and bring here is still edible. But for supermarkets, this, is, this food is already trash. From my perspective, I would, it would be a mistake to waste it. So we are in favor of free access to food. Free at least for a certain group of the population, like homeless or people with low incomes. Anyways, what we want in the end is food justice. Next slide, please. Second testimony. During the three years of my research, I have visited more than 10 community kitchens in Berlin. Out of 30, community kitchens are spaces that unfold through a sense of caring for others, in which the reason for cooking is to provide. Thus, community kitchens are the perfect expression of care for others and with others. In the Tommy Weisbecker house uh, here in Mitte in Berlin, I met Elisabeth a food saver and a participant of the community kitchen. She tells me that rescuing food from the food sharing movement is not enough. The portions are not enough for a kitchen of 15 people or more. Besides, it is usually bread what is rescued. And she points out something that catches my attention. Um, and she says, there are already well-structured and organized networks in the city that gather all the food for themselves. It is like a food waste mafia. The same thing happens with what can be rescued from supermarkets. You check the app and a few seconds later there is nothing available. And it's just that there are people in the back who already know exactly what time and where the food is going to be released. Sometimes what we do is to collect what's left of the food waste and distribute it among ourselves or offer it to people with limited resources. It's another way to help by making sure that someone else is going to eat that food. We still cook with things we buy at the supermarket and that's why we have a Zoli Kaze or a Solidarity Cash Box. Uh, what interests, yeah, and she says, what, what interests us is to eat, to cook for others and to have a space for a dialogue and encounter. I think it is very important to cook for others, she says because it is another way of expressing affection. Food unites us and we are a political organization. For us, cooking is a practice, a practice of knowledge and culture. Next slide, please. Third testimony. In January of this year, I met with the founder of the food sharing movement. At the end of a very inspiring and magnificent talk, I asked her, should there be such a thing as food waste? And she answered, yes. Otherwise, the food sharing movement wouldn't exist. I was really shocked. I couldn't believe she was privileging her organization at the expense of food waste management. And of course, I am strongly against of food waste. I come from Mexico and there, I mean, we don't even know what food waste is. We don't waste food. Or, I mean, not everyone, yeah, but mostly. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, so how do we now understand these as acts of commoning and care? The act of commoning uh, does not refer only to the ability of administrator good. It's about sharing experiences, knowledges, and sharing goods in a way that guarantees the satisfaction of the members who practice this commoning. And when, and, and, 
it's also important to ask, when do we see practices of commoning in these testimonies I just presented? Um, well, behind the management of food waste, there is always an organization that has rules and norms and moral systems that define how to save food. And when we talk about commoning, we have to stop thinking of a close and isolated community sitting in front of a campfire, um, yeah, making horizontal decisions. Commoning doesn't happen like that. It happens on a day-to-day -day basis. And the fact that there is a community that distributes food for free already speaks of a step towards commoning. Food is distributed without expectation of profit. There is a process of decommodification of food. And in addition to this, networks of solidarity are built through practices of food provisioning. And this is what we can learn, for instance, from the first testimony with the food sharing network in the, in the Gentestrasse, in the street Genta. And yeah, now, what happens when we talk about commoning and food provisioning? As I said before, food provisioning is one of the most ba basic acts of care. And here's where feminist theories become relevant because they remind us that the way and circumstances in which food is provisioned is defined by diverse relations of power and political and economic arrangements. For instance, who is in charge of provisioning this food for whom, where, when, and why is quite relevant to us who is in charge of cooking or, or saving uh, this food for others? And yesterday, um, Dr. Terani Kroner was saying that in, in the households, uh, women cook in the stove, but when it becomes something related to fire, then men appear and they, they grill in the, in the public space. That's also quite interesting to know what happens when something that it's private becomes suddenly public and who takes part in this dynamic? Yeah, um, so dynamics of inclusion and exclusion are a permanent problem in the food industry and at all stages of the food chain. And I am not surprised that on such a small scale as, as the locality, neoliberal actions continue to be replicated. As we saw with these organized networks, Elizabeth was referring to in the second testimony, the mafia of the food waste. This is a way in which exclusion is perpetrated even in a communitarian way. I mean, commoning can be also performed in capitalist societies and capitalist communities. So exclusion and inclusion are experienced in different ways. And this is also when we talk about food, Exclusion is also linked together with, with rivalry and conditions of excludability that arise from mercantile, organizational, institutional, and cultural dynamics. And here it's quite relevant to ask who can have access first to certain foods and why, and who can have never access to them, even when we are talking about alternative food networks, as like the food sharing movement. No one, not, not everyone actually ha can have access to that, to, to this food waste, uh, edible food waste. And how is this exclusion contested in the everyday life? It's also quite relevant when we talk about alternat alternativeness. Um, so yeah, how people navigate and negotiate this exclusion, how and way with whom we employ, for instance, bargain practices, barting, or when we build solidarity networks in order to share uh, and provision food to others. Um, I would like to finish my presentation just by mentioning that organizations that are built on a community basis or with objectives for the common good do not escape uh, relationships of conflict and personal interest. And several scholars within the food studies have already mentioned the problems that the local trap brings with it. So problematize alternative food me uh, networks means to question to what extent they are alternative, yeah, of course, but also where are they located? Who are in charge of uh, moving and building these alternative food ne networks and who is behind 
uh, the decision making process within these networks. And yeah, so thank you very much. And we see you in the Q&A mm -hmm. section. Thank you very much, um, Marlene, um, for your uh, presentation. This was very insightful and uh, you already touched upon some of the questions that we will be discussing in the second round. I would now like to hand over immediately to Mai. 10 minutes, please. Thank you. We cannot hear you, Mai. Yep. Could you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can see it and we can hear you. Wait, um, yeah. So, um, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Martina and Gulai. Um, you already, uh, what do you call it, uh, introduced me. So, um, hi everyone, thank you for joining uh, the, the Zoom meeting. My presentation uh, today is about um, hungry coal. Um, when I talk about hungry coal, uh, it's referred to Indonesia as the biggest coal uh, extraction um, and exporter. So, sorry, I need to, yeah. Um, hungry call uh, for I actually offering uh, for rethinking with um, energy uh, justice. So um, by rethinking with energy justice, uh, we can uncovering the hidden consequence um, of extractivism to food security and um, energy transition. Uh, agri, -food cons agri food consumer around 30% uh, of the world uh, um, total energy and the AU food sector heavily relies on 79% of uh, fossil fuels. Therefore, I argue we need to rethinking uh, food with um, energy, especially as extractivism uh, um, process. So I um, connecting the, the foods, uh, rethinking foods with energy. When I mention energy, I'll talk more about coal as a commodity uh, frontier and as extractivist activity. So extractive extractivism is like uh, moving a huge amount of um, uh, natural resources for export uh, and its effect on people livelihood, the topic of my PhD research. I uh, refer to use extractivism as a lens to understand the relation in the weaving and overlapping issues between food and energy, it's allow us to see the intertwined multi-layer power relation and their effects on people's food security. Moreover, for feminist political ecology, positionality is important to understand how historical and social change shape identity. Thus, I bring my embodied experiences as ecological justice activists uh, for connecting uh, three islands in Indonesia um, to understanding extractivism as a cyclical process of digging in Kalimantan, that's the island of Kalimantan. Most of the coal extracted uh, from Kalimantan uh, and transporting and burning and consuming to Java. Most of the coal in Indonesia is consumed in Java Island uh, and Sulawesi. Furthermore, as a trans-territorial process, extractivism connects the global south, which provides the raw material for the global north through so-called climate neutral uh, economy. This photo story uh, presentation will answer two questions. Why does extraction and burning of coal put pressure on food security in Indonesia? and how the energy transition program for responding to the climate crisis, such as climate neutral economy, relate with subsequent pressure to food security in Indonesia. Let me start with Hungry Goal, a joint report of JATAM and Waterkeeper Alliance, which I use for the presentation title, 
I'm working with the JATAM for my PhD research. JATAM is Indonesian um, NGOs that co-funded with communities affected by mining and oil uh, gas in Indonesia. The report explains um, the increase of global demands of coal threatened food security. Um, but some of the report also uh, described the experience in Makroman village, Samarinda, the capital city of East Kalimantan, where I did my master thesis. In uh, Makroman, I was, I was living with farmer, um, Komari and Nurbaiti, here are the pictures. They have two plots of rice field that can be planted twice a year with natural irrigation channels and one vegetable uh, and fruit garden plot. I was staying also with Bahar. Uh, she is a fish farmer who has successfully grown tilapia and goldfish, but it didn't last long. Since the government granted mining permits in 2004, started um, digging in uh, 2006, and then uh, because the hill is uh, destroyed and also forest, the first mud uh, flooding happened in 2008, polluted the garden, the water, and also the rice field. So since then, um, the soil is not fertile anymore. And then they increasing to use fertilizer and also pesticide. And uh, later in 2015, the village was surrounded by egg uh, abandoned coal pits. If I make it larger, it's like this. So Bahar has a better economy converting the fish pond and rice field into the chili plants, but Komari and Nurbaiti cannot afford it. As a result, rice and fish mostly had to bulk from the market. From Kalimantan, let we move to Java. I was born and grew up in Java Island, the home of 60% of Indonesian population. In the past, Java was the center of colonial rule, with which 150 years ago determined that all Indonesian land belonging to the colonial state. The Indonesian state continues the same models and provides concession for most extractive projects. The main cities in Java were the trading center in the colonial period later become the center of growth and modernity as an indicator of development of an economic growth requiring high energy con uh, consumption. Around 80% of Indonesian energy is fossil fuels, most of which are coal. Coal from Kalimantan was transported and burned in coal power plant in Java, which is most of that, where most of that is uh, built in the coastal area. Currently, at least 170 um, coal power plants around Indonesia. One of these is the Chilachap coal power plant in central Java. Uh, it's near the village Karangkadri, Chilachap. The Chinese company built Chilachap coal power plant on an agriculture area cultivated by landless farmer. However, since 2008, they can no longer farm. The resident who live on Lead 300 meters from the power plant was forced to move because of health problems, polluted air by coal dust. Meanwhile, hot water, uh, hot waste water from the power plants made the fish away, threatened a small uh, farmer who owns small rice field. In addition, the fishermen were forced to catch fish far farther away because the power plant occupied the fishing area and coal waste cause uh, the fish way. So understanding extractivism as a cyclical process from extraction to burning coal help us to see how extractivism and food security are related. However, uh, understanding coal as a trans-territory process, we need to shift to the coast of central Sulawesi. In the village of Ganda Ganda, Lambolo Bay, the coal power plants and nickel smelter of China, China's company only 500 meters from the resident Petasia district with gets coal also from Kalimantan. The nickel mine is damaging aquatic ecosystem and disrupt the fishing area. In addition, the local health official mentioned 
that the power plant and smelter cause respiratory problems, diagnosed with lung inflammation, coughing up, and uh, vomiting blood. It's related with, in the last five years, the nickel mine and smelter are increasing in Sulawesi Island due to increased demand for lithium ion batteries. As, a nick, uh, as a nickel is a critical component in the battery for electric vehicles. According to the EU, the global battery demand is expected to increase 14 fold by 2030, and they could account for 17, 17% of that demand. In uh, page two, new EU regulatory framework for batteries in 2021 state the development, production, and use of batteries are key to the EU's transition to climate neutral economy. Given the important role they play in the rollout of zero emission, mobility, and the storage of intermittent renewable energy. In 2019, the EU Trade Commission filed a complaint with the World Trade Organization in November, accusing Indonesia's ban on, ban on nickel or export of breaking a free trade rule. Meanwhile, the Indonesian government is pushing more nickel smelters to build and increase coal extraction for employment and economic reason. The EU, Indonesian, and trade dispute continues to ignore the hidden consequence of extractivism to food security and climate. In conclusion, in Indonesia, the hungry coal transforms the land, water, and air, and shapes the social relation, creating a multi-extractive space that disrupts food security. Those that thinking food with extractivism lens help to understand the intertwined and overlapping power relation on energy, food security, and climate change affecting people's livelihood. As a food producer and consumer, we can contribute to reducing the food energy impact by changing our male culture. Thanks, Parto, for yesterday's inspiration. Dietary and food purchasing behavior, like buying local food, respecting seasonality, food commoning, what uh, Marlene mentioned, and supporting communities, uh, supporting agriculture, like Solawi in uh, Germany, or purchase properly using domestic appliance for minimizing domestic food waste, or increasing uh, you know, your activism for um, ecological justice. Thank you. Super, thank you very much, Mai. This was really on time. And this was extremely interesting to link extractivism with alternative food together, um, which opens, uh, for me at least, a, a completely new perspective. Uh, I would now like to hand over to in it still, the floor is yours. 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Gula. And thanks to my Marlena and Martina for starting us off and introducing us to different topics for today's roundtable. And um, let me share screen. Okay, is it working? Okay. So, Thank you for joining us today and uh, this afternoon, everyone. And today I'm going to be talking about the politics of scale, thoughts from encountering ethical agricultural practices in Tamil Nadu, India. In thinking through the politics of scale in relation to agriculture and food consumption, this presentation draws on conversations with farmers, NGOs and organic food outlets in and around the city of Chennai in Tamil Nadu, South India. Through these conversations, the maintenance of small scale food relations and practices for both food activists and farming collectives emerged as an ethical practice shaped by the needs, knowledges and struggles of agricultural communities. Due to their close, um, due to their commitment in being close in close relation with farmers, urban food activists articulated that their work and ideas are not scalable. These ethical practices and articulations, I argue, because they are informed by situated knowledges, have lessons for agricultural alternatives elsewhere and raise important questions about what constitutes ethical agriculture and for whom does it matter. Rather than suggesting a simple binary of small scale and large scale agriculture, I want to point to how ethical practices might change in relation to scales of sociality. 
My concern in relation to this issue comes from a combination of a curiosity and the way ethical relations play out between humans and the more than human, and my desire to question and denaturalize the normative assumptions about agriculture that have been shaped by colonialism. The latter is also related to ongoing critical reflection on my positionality as a white Scottish scholar researching with communities in India and the colonial continuities that potentially represents. I do not attempt to speak for or represent the farmers and activists I work with, but I do try with care and recognition to bring their words and knowledge to bear upon the imaginaries that inform ways of knowing agriculture, the normative ways of knowing agriculture. So with this in mind, now my slide didn't change. Can you see? No? <laughs> there we go, slowly. So with this in mind, I will start with a quote from Jivita, who co-founded an organic food store in Chennai. And she says, we got more and more convinced that to support farmers is not to insist on certification, but we will insist on personal verification and connections. It means a lot of commitment to that process and it is not centrally scalable. It is more locally replicable. This idea from Jivita that I attempt to, to think with today. First, I want to return to last February February last year, as I was just beginning my fieldwork in Tamil Nadu, South India. I was in conversation with Jivita, sitting in the cool of the shop's library area, which also doubles as the storage area for the weekly vegetable boxes. She was telling me the story of the organization and the principles that inform it. What came out clearly for me was that the connections between the farmers and the store were central to the ethical principles and practices of the organization. In other words, what made sense to the farmers was what guided the practice of the organization. This was also reflected in the words of Vijay, another employee of the organic store. We are running behind the farmers, not the money. This relation between the traders and farmers is of course more complex than I give space to here but I start with this vignette to show a particular scale of sociality. So now if we zoom out a bit and look at the dominant perspectives of agriculture, the narratives and imaginations of large scale monocropping and chemical use tend to be a prevalent norm, particularly in agricultural science and policy. This prevalence is arguably maintained through enduring notions of scarcity that can be related to colonial famine narratives of famine Although famine is of course a reality and cannot be downplayed as a mere social construct, there is a particular representation of famine that occurred through the colonial gaze and can be in part related to the development of agricultural science during the latter years of the 19th century. not going to change. Okay. During this period, the British colonial regime conducted agricultural experiments in India, which as Anand Pandian argues, were as much about controlling and improving the landscapes as they were about controlling and improving the bodies and moralities of the communities who lived there. As Meta Hoff and Aluche argue, the effects of this politics of scarcity can be directly related to intensive agriculture and other forms of extractivism. I'm sorry, I'm just going to... Sorry, maybe you need to click the arrow uh, on the yeah, left. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm clicking every oh, button sorry. I can. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going around clicking them all. Yeah, it moves, okay. Um, so as scholars such as Van Dana Shiva, Jack, Jack Kloppenberg and many more have argued, alternative agriculture and the local knowledges that inform it offers an important challenge to these dominant perspectives. 
Furthermore, as FPE scholars have highlighted, knowledges and alternative practices are co-constituted by the human and more than human in socio-natural entanglements. So if we understand large scale agriculture as part of an agricultural science informed by a colonial ethic of control and improvement imparted from a distant metropole onto colonized lands and peoples, does small scale agriculture informed by ecologies, struggles for land and farmers embodied knowledge constitute an ethical alternative? So when I was in Tamil Nadu, I visited three different collective farms. In this brief experience, I learned from the farmers and NGOs working with them that collective farming takes many forms and follows different principles and methods of agriculture. Whilst land sizes of farms also differentiated, it was notable that the small scale of the agriculture was what invited collectivity of different kinds, whether it was individual farmers coming together to form larger collectives for economic benefit or landless and marginal farmers collectivizing to access land. So although the forms of collectivity were diverse, the motivations to form them at least partially derived from the material and symbolic consequences of operating at a small scale. However, and as Marlena has already pointed to, the small scale is not to be romanticized. The intersections of class, caste and gender played significant roles in constituting who was considered a farmer, what kinds of labor they could do, how much they were paid and who was allowed to own land. For two out of the three collectives I met, they articulated their marginal position as a consequence of the intersection of caste oppression and patriarchal norms. These intersecting, intersecting structures of oppression further contributed to class hierarchies and reduced economic possibilities in comparison to larger agricultural corporations and medium-sized farmers. So this demonstrates the importance of scale in agriculture as a political issue, I argue. And it was not just farmers who saw scale as an important political concern. As I already described, food activists in Chennai were keen to highlight that their food outlets were not scalable for the very reason that their outlet was connected to the needs of farmers who grew food organically and at a small scale. For them, this meant offering a food store with organic produce sold to them at farm sold to them by farmers at a fixed price and not to the fluctuations of the market. Their vegetables, for instance, had two main price categories according to the types of crops grown in different climates in Tamil Nadu. Hill veg came from the Nilgiris of Tamil Nadu's Eastern Ghats, Ghats and long ve local veg came from the lowlands around the city of Chennai. The embeddedness of these principles that originate from the experience of farmers, in particular landscapes and ecologies, necess necess necessitates <laughs> a scale of operation that is able to maintain that connection. To repeat the words of Jivita, it is not centrally scalable, it is more locally replicable. So I want to end with some thoughts from India, but this time from J.C. Kumarapa. J.C. Kumarapa who wrote part one of his famous work titled An Economy of Permanence, whilst in jail in 1944. The British colonial regime jailed him for his publications criticizing their fiscal policies during World War II, which further impoverished Indian farmers. His theory of an economy of permanence inspired by Gandhian economics resonates with various forms of alternative economic thinking that has come since particularly feminist contributions to the ideas of diverse or community economies and the economies and ethics and politics of care. These ideas recognize the plurality of economic practices, seeing capitalist exchange as one of many forms of economy. Furthermore, similar to feminist approaches to the ethic of care, in Kumarapa's theorization, he understands economies not as separate from other forms of life or ways of being,
but as a part of human and more than human activity in the world. In this perspective, small scale agriculture and collectivity has to be understood as contingent upon the, very, the various forms of sociality, including oppressive structures such as caste, patriarchy and capitalism. And yet I'd argue that cultivating and trading food at a small scale is not only shaped by unequal relations of power over, but can be understood as a site of emerging ethical relations that arise from an economy of permanence, embedded and interdependent with human and more than human communities. And I end there. <laughs> I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Enid. Beautiful. Thank you so much. These presentations are really very inspiring. And um, but I'm not going to comment now, but hand over directly to Dimas and Patrick. The floor is yours. Okay, let me put up my presentation. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Gulai, for chairing uh, this roundtable discussion, and also to Martina, Inet, and uh, Mai for inviting me and uh, Patrick to be part of this event. I suppose, like we could, I could say that both of us are really glad to be here. So, uh, well, give me a second. Mm. Mm. Okay, so is it on the slideshow right now or? Oh, well, now <laughs> my note is gone. <laughs> okay, give me a second. Uh, okay, let me just uh, show you my slides so then I still have, uh, well. Or maybe uh, Cleo, do you have, do you mind if you maybe like put up my presentation? Uh, is it okay? Or I could also try okay. and share. I'm sorry, should I put on the presentation? Oh yes, please if you <laughs> if you have it. Yeah, I was just between the languages. Oh okay. <laughs> But I could also share um, if, it, if it helps. Okay. Well, where am I? The... Did you not see my screen? It was there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you put up I again? Just didn't... Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, Thanks, then, uh, Cleo. Uh, yeah, just to start off with uh, with our presentation, uh, we would like to uh, briefly describe about the inorganic project that I am in, that, that we are in. Uh, so basically, it is a, a collaborative uh, transdisciplinary research project between the University of Passau and two universities in Indonesia. Uh, uh, so we collaborated with uh, IPB, the Agricultural uh, Bogor Agricultural Institute in West Java, and with Atmajaya uh, University in Yogyakarta in Central Java, as well as with an NGO called uh, Indonesian Organic Alliance. So uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so in this presentation, we will uh, share our research with organic farmers in central Java, uh, which is the focus of my uh, research, as you can see in the little uh, box on the right. And Patrick will share uh, his research with organic farmers in West Java, the little box on the left. And uh, we would like to remind you that, you know, the stories that we will uh, present about organic farmers are specific to our field sites. And because as uh, Indonesia is culturally, uh, socially, and ecologically very diverse, uh, we would like to avoid uh, overgeneralization of our research. 
Uh, so the next slide, please. So uh, this is a typical landscape of lowland uh, Java. Uh, these are the pictures of wet paddy fields uh, and uh, just a bit about uh, organic farmers in Java. Uh, they are predominantly smallholders, meaning that uh, they own uh, land less than two hectares. Even like two hectares is already quite a lot because in my uh, field work, I think on average, the land ownership is around a few, uh, uh, a few uh, thousand meters uh, per farmer. And also they are still, uh, and the majority are uh, landless farmers who usually work as uh, sharecroppers. So what they do is, you know, they, they uh, work in other uh, people's uh, lands and then you know there are different arrangements on how you know they share the kind of like the profit and uh, which uh, capitals are invested in in farming. And uh, and as uh, Mai also mentioned in the previous presentation that uh, Java has always been uh, a very populated one of the most populated islands in Indonesia, and it's also one of the main uh, agricultural production areas. So that basically land has always been an issue uh, on the island. And as you can see that uh, in the right picture, basically this one plot of paddy field is divided into smaller parcels, right? So you can see that, you know, in each parcel, basically they, uh, it corresponds to different stages of rice planting, right? So uh, some rice seedlings are in the seed nursery, some are uh, rice plants that were harvested and some will be harvested. So, you know, it's quite messy. Uh, and uh, I think what I'm trying to suggest is that, you know, it's also this kind of uh, diversity in, 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 uh, in rice farming provides, uh, all, creates not only technical, but also social and cultural challenges in practicing organic farming. All right, so the next slide, please. And so basically, and uh, whereas in the previous slide, I talk about uh, rice farming, and then in this slide, it focuses on, uh, rice, uh, on vegetable farming or horticulture. So in Java, in lowland Java, usually they are uh, done in, uh, in this kind of uh, little hills or bedengan in Indonesian language. And it's very important, as you can see that in the bottom left and the uh, bottom right photos that uh, farmers erected this, uh, have, have to put up these plastic uh, roofs, right? To shelter the vegetables from, uh, from direct uh, raindrops. Because, you know, uh, first, you know, rain, like the direct uh, raindrops can damage the plants. Uh, and the other thing is because the, uh, the, the rainwater is relatively acidic, so then uh, because of the air pollution in Java, so then basically, you know, the, without, uh, you know, this plastic roof, then uh, it's very difficult to do uh, vegetable farming. And then, uh, but what is important to keep in mind in terms of this diversity is that uh, doing agriculture is a social practice as uh, many organic farmers told me. And it means that the individual decision, decision makings on what and how to grow are very much informed uh, by farmers' interactions with broader societies, particularly with their neighbors and government officials. And also uh, their interactions with, uh, with different knowledges and values. And Patrick will uh, elaborate further on these issues. And I suggest that thinking about agriculture as a social practice provides an entry point to uh, thinking about alternative food, right? Because it, it also asks us to think about what interactions uh, with land, with plants, with other people, with neighbors, also with knowledges we have and what we want to have, right? Uh, and then, so the next slide, please. So, uh, and then what 
particular uh, I suppose like historical uh, time in, in organic farming in Indonesia, it happened in uh, early 2000s, where the government started to formulate uh, national uh, uh, organic agricultural policies, right, to, in order to create a premium market for organic farmers. Uh, and it, it, at the same time, this process uh, deepening farmers' uh, dependency on private and public sectors. Uh, so for example, on uh, the two pictures on the right, I tried to show, uh, basically these are a representative from uh, Nestle and they visited this village to recruit uh, farmers uh, to, in order for them to, uh, to supply organic rice for uh, baby food, uh, for their baby food products. Right? And on the picture on the left, it's the picture of uh, farmers preparing uh, organic uh, liquid fertilizer. And as you can see that, you know, in those two pictures, uh, farmers are usually uh, present in the group because uh, usually uh, both, you know, government act uh, of or state actors or like pr or private sector uh, actors, they, they would come and visit uh, farmer groups instead of individual farmers at least you know, in the very first stage, right? Uh, and then uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so, and the picture on the right uh, shows uh, the, the first uh, harvest of uh, organic, organic farm. Uh, and what you can see is that it shows, you know, the presence of a government official, uh, for example, the extension worker, from the Department of Agriculture present, as well as a person from military. And on the left, you see the, this is a, a certification process where uh, uh, organic inspectors uh, interviewed organic farmers to check, you know, the completion of their uh, documentation, right? So again, you know, uh, basically what we try to show here, what I try to show here is that you know, in all of this picture, what is central is the presence of, of, of farmers as members of farmer groups, because usually uh, in order to access government support, they need to be part of uh, farmer groups. And I think uh, from here, I would like to pass my presentation to Patrick. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Dimas. So um, next slide, please. I just want to share some additional insights because since you must have already mentioned it, there is different actors um, who play a role when it comes to organic farming in Indonesia. And I want to pose the question, if we think about alternative food systems and um, alternative agriculture system uh, as a societal transformation, then um, where do certain ideas about what is organic agriculture and what is sustainable agriculture and a sustainable food system come from. So who communicates and establishes these ideas um, and knowledge and also values and strategies for organic and sustainable agriculture. And I want to share two um, cases uh, from my research in uh, West Java. So the first one, we see here on the pictures, it is um, the, um, the uh, what is it, Pesantren, so called Pesantren Ecology Atarik. So it's an Islamic, um, uh, not really a boarding school, but a school with a, a masjid Atarik that you can see here. And if you have seen um, a mosque in Indonesia, this one looks a bit different. Um, so it's really focusing on this ecological. Um, ideas based on um, religious uh, texts and, and ideas that exist in the Quran and in the verses of the Quran. So um, maybe we go to the next slide. And I present to you um, the leader uh, and the Kiai of the Pesantren is the man you see in the uh, two pictures up there in the white shirt. His name is Abi Iban. And he is um, in his teaching about um, ecological ideas of sustainability, 
based on his religious um, ideas that he has, uh, as I said, again, from the Quran and religious texts. And um, he tries to teach these ideas to the uh, different communities in the region. So there's farmers group, as Dimas mentioned, and also individuals and um, groups who are interested in this interrelated um, ecological ideas, uh, religious ecological ideas. So he is teaching groups and people who are interested about this in his, um, in his religious school, in his Pesantren. And what is also interesting, he is also frequently invited to uh, other mosques and religious places all around in the region. So he is trying to spread his knowledge and ideas about um, alternative agriculture, um, organic agriculture. And uh, he is motivating people to uh, cultivate um, herbs and vegetables themselves. So you can see the picture in the bottom right where after one of his preaching sessions, he visited um, people in this neighborhood and, um, and uh, would inspect their gardens and teach them on site about uh, produ producing, as I said, vegetables and herbs. So um, this is his idea and mission of um, promoting alternative food systems in the sense that he is encouraging people to cultivate um, foods themselves. And um, yeah, maybe we go to the second example because um, I think time is- Yeah, time uh, is time very is over. Out. So please make it as brief as okay. possible. Thank you. Okay, very, just very quickly, um, if we go to the next slide, it's, it's only one slide anyways. So I just want to present the second example. And I, it's, a, yeah, it's a bit tricky because I'm trying to talk slowly and then we're running out of time. But anyways, so this is the second example I wanted to show you. So it's the Eco Learning Camp in Bandung. Bandung is a city quite close to Jakarta, to the capital city, and um, this eco-learning camp is actually um, a Catholic institution, and the leader is um, Father Ferry, the person you can see in this picture the four of, of the four of us to the, to the right. He is wearing the shirt, He Who Teaches Learns, which I uh, like a lot. So Father Ferry is leading the eco-learning camp and also trying to teach people in the region about alternative um, agricultural systems, especially people coming from Jakarta, from the big city, um, where, and he's trying to teach them about ecological system and the eco village that, that he has in mind. And as you can see here on the right in the bottom, he's also cooperating with big companies and also with the government. So that's a kind of a difference to uh, the Ibang and the eco -Pesantren. So he has a bit of a different approach, but in the end, although one is um, an Islamic preacher and the other one is the Catholic priest. They both combine um, religious values with ideas of um, ecological and sustainable agriculture and really actively try to promote these values and knowledge um, among the community and spread these ideas, alternative ideas about um, sustainable agriculture. So I think I'm going to stop here and um, we can get into a hopefully fruitful discussion. And then I'm also happy to answer the questions if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Patrick, and um, uh, please, sorry for um, for pressing you to stop because the time is, is uh, pretty advanced now. Uh, because we do have a second round, maybe you can also add uh, the things that you still wanted to say uh, into the second round. Thank you very much. This was a very um, um, insightful uh, uh, panel. And what we are going to discuss now are two questions, which I um, inserted into um, the chat so that everyone can follow what binds all these um, presentations together is the question of what actually alternative means if we use this term and we we had some aspects in all these presentations which is relationality sociability or um, ethical ideas about what alternative could be, or as um, mentioned in the last part, uh, what I would call, I don't know whether you, you agree or not, Dimas and, and Patrick, but normativity uh, to or normative ideas, which are part of these alternative ideas coming from other social areas and spaces. So um, what is um, the questions that we are going to discuss are 
firstly, what is the meaning of alternative food systems and what are the challenges of inclusivity in food and ec economic alternatives? And I would like to invite all panelists to very briefly relate to these um, questions, yeah, our four presenters. And afterwards, I would like to open the floor for the audience. So maybe we can this time take the other way around. Patrick and Dimas, we will start with you. And please directly relate in a very short comment to these two questions from your case studies. Thank you very much. Yeah, Dimas, go ahead. Do you want to start. start so then you can speak a bit longer? <laughs> I'm a bit shorter. <laughs> Okay, anyways, yeah, um, we can we can do like this. So um, I'll start with the question, what is the meaning of alternative in food systems? And I think uh, what we both try to show, Dimas and I, is that there is alternatives, um, first in terms of um, the approach towards uh, organic in Indonesia, since there is the government approach and, um, and the national framework that is trying to establish um, a certification system for organic food and uh, trying to, to uh, implement large scale agricultural projects that are labeled or, as organic. And what we found in our cases in Central and West Java is that there is alternative food systems and agricultural systems, meaning that there is um, organic farmers or farmer groups who try to establish um, organic agriculture, not necessarily on a smaller scale, but with different ideas of what organic means and, and with different aspects of um, sustainable agriculture as well. So also social um, sustainable, sustainability and also in terms of ecosystem um, protection. So this is what we, I would say, understand um, uh, as alternative food systems. And the second question, what are the challenges of inclusivity in food and economic alternatives? So I think it's, it's pretty much related that because um, these large scale projects um, can be kind of criticized in terms of inclusivity. And uh, that is why these alternatives in, uh, exist in the in the first place and then again also looking at these um, alternative ideas about organic agriculture I would say it's also um, especially in my case interesting because as Gula said it's it's, it's a way uh, in a way it's a normative um, angle and since these religious ideas come in it's very interesting um, in terms of inclusivity because what I found is that it's actually um, playing a role when it comes to the, the groups that um, uh, are taught about these ideas in the, in the religious spheres. But then again, religion doesn't really play um, uh, such an in, in, uh, important role in the sense that it excludes uh, people with a, a different religious denomination from joining and from learning and exchanging. So they, there is interreligious dialogue and transfer uh, of, of exchange uh, and exchange of knowledge. So um, as a conclusion, I would say they are much more inclusive um, than it might appear in the first sense, even if they are based on religious ideas. So, mm -hmm. sorry, <laughs> it took a bit long. <laughs> Dimas, would you like to add anything or? Uh, yes, if I may. Uh, so I think in order to answer the two questions, uh, well, based on my, uh, well, in my research, I mostly uh, work with organic farmers. So the issue of, uh, you know, the differentiation between the producer and the consumer of organic uh, products are a bit uh, blurred in this context, right? And at the same time, uh, based on my informal conversation with people in the city, you know, who don't do any gardening or farming and but, you know, who consume organic products, as well as the survey of some of our colleagues from uh, who is part of the uh, project. What is both kind of surprising and not surprising for me is that, you know, one of the main reasons why people consume or purchase organic products is because of health reason, like individual health, right? But at the same time, it seems that farmers are still absent right, in this kind of discourse. And farmers have always been absent, you know, in the discussion, even in, in conventional agriculture, right? So the question is, I think if you want, at least for me, you know, in order to think about alternative food system, 
then the question is, well, I try to put uh, both the embodied knowledge and embodied uh, experience of farmers in the center. So, I mean, of course, because I'm focusing on agriculture, so I talk about farmers, but I think we can also expand it to growers right? or even like gardeners, right? So when we think about, you know, what kind of relations around food that we want to have, and we could, you know, in our mind, we could try to put, you know, the embodied experiences and knowledge of those, you know, who grow vegetables, right? Uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dimas. The question that always comes up to me is, um, is another way of eating um, the solution or, or um, the definition for alternative or do we need structural changes? And maybe, and I think the others also in their presentations pointed to this question kind of, do we have to first have to have these huge structural changes is that the alternative or do, can we really change something through our very local and small scale relations um so uh by saying this by stating this i would like to hand over to Enid. yeah thank you and i i think i had a thought the other day about um the meaning of alternative and it was actually when reading the paper by um, Besner Care that we Besner Care et al that we read together, um, me, Marlena, Ulai, and another colleague Anna, and the concept of the metabolic rift that they they define as a set of relational, ecological, and social processes. And I'm quoting. I'm sorry, disrupting material, epistemic, and social pathways. And so the rifts include ecological rifts, robbing the soil of organic material and biota, as well as nutrients, and epistemic rifts, robbing the farmer's knowledge and close observation and e of ecological processes with e agro-ecosystem landscapes. So my question is maybe the practices which contribute to that repairing of the rifts that they go into detail about in their case study, and also which I could see in the collective the collectives I was working with, um, is that co what constitutes an alternative? I, it's a question, and I think um, with the collect the collectives I was working with, I think they were probably, yeah, it's hard for me to say, but in there would have to be more detail there on around the social potential rifts that have occurred. Um, I'm thinking about the kind of structures. Um, which are, um, which yeah, this oppressive structures which I mentioned in the um, in the presentation, and in relation to inclusivity, um, I think that the organic store kind of uh, that I mentioned gave a good example of how this is incredibly complex, but also the inclusivity, and I think Marlena mentioned this like inclusivity and exclusivity are often happening in tandem and are co-constituting each other. I'm sorry, I'm speaking really fast. <laughs> I'll slow down. So whilst the e organic store was actively including farmers who were excluded from, for example, the organic certification processes they couldn't afford, um, which is another consequence of being small scale, at the same time, their prices meant that some people I spoke to felt it was unaffordable for many. Um, and this influenced a sense of a class space in the, in the market and in the shop. And I think the work by Rachel Slocum has shown these kind of unspoken privileges are often felt or enforced. Um, yeah, often felt or in, enforced in unspoken ways, um, creating a kind of sense of exclusivity or a very real actually experienced experience of exclusivity, even if it doesn't constitute a, a kind of conscious act by the people within those uh, organizations. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Wonderful. Mai, it's your turn. Uh, yes. Um, well, I need thank you to, to bring the... Um, um, I need to oh, because it's too short. Uh, okay. Um, my question is uh, when come uh, to uh, connecting the the issue of uh, energy and food. 
it's about alternative for who. Um, I think it's important to bring this because in my country also um, everything that uh, is, it seems new, but it's not new, they call alternative. So I think it's important to thinking uh, alternative, really looking that everything is res relational. Um, like um, I feel that uh, we talk about um, energy and food uh, or economic is always like sectoral things. So I think it's really important to um, reflect that first, uh, there is three words that come to my mind when talk about um, um, alternative uh, and also inclusive. In, in, inclusive is first is about relational. Um, I mean, uh, you know, we have a different scale that, that always relational each other and uh, sometimes uh, destruct, destructing one another. I think it's important to bring what alternative mean. And the second is, it's important really uh, bring the situated uh, uh, knowledge um, of people, um, their experience, their locality, uh, which uh, for me is important to uh, the first question, uh, what, what alternative uh, for who? And uh, the scale. Um, I think it's important at the moment to bring the alternative uh, to the big uh, or the mainstream things, um, like you know the, the big scale of uh, development, the big scale of economy, um, and even like uh, divided each other. I think it's important to what uh, Madeleine uh, um, uh, discuss about the communing in different way, for example. That's uh, come to my mind when we talk about the alternative. Thanks, Gulai. Thank you very much, Mai. And then the last comment, and then I will open the floor to everyone. Marlene, please. Um, yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, I would say that alternative food networks in a very general uh, meaning or description, uh, description oppose uh, to many elements of the globalized corporate food system. And um, they can be summarized as sustainable strategies for the future of food. But alternative food networks sometimes forget about the way people have access to this food that is alternative. And they also forget the way they transform it. And also if these people have the means to transform this food, to cook it. Um, yeah, uh, and the food chain doesn't finish when purchasing food. It goes further um, in the household and also in the disposal stage of the, of the food chain. And here in the household, we encounter food habits and food lifestyles. Um, yeah, that are practices that can impact uh, agroecological processes in other localities. So food is completely interrelated and it's also based or it's embedded in this re relational uh, aspect between the consumer and the producer and all the actors involved at different levels, so as institutions, etc. But what I want to say with this, for instance, is that these lifestyles or these food habits that are alternative, like having a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet and buying in the local market, well, you don't know if, or in the bio, bio market, you don't know if the, the quinoa or the organic avocado you eat in your vegan diet may be full of blood or maybe of command obedience relations in, in the production place. Um, but yeah, so this is another topic, but in, um, yeah, I mean, alternative food networks are a very much related to community-based organizations. And this is something that I'd, I would like to highlight because it's the most important thing of, of these networks. And they try to emphasize um, of the reintegration of the local and rural urban economies. 
And this brings also different ways of doing other economies, community economies, solidarity economies, biting, sharing. And this is the, the, like the meat we need to extract, well not extract, but explore and, and get embedded in this and practice it more. So reform, uh, the alternative food networks try to reform uh, they industrialize farming and do it differently, uh, try to reintegrate local markets, create market niches. And yeah, and mainly having an organic and a local criteria. And then it comes other things like certifications and things like that to be organic. And that's also also completely controversial within these food networks, alternative food networks. And yeah, so questioning the alternativeness uh, goes in many directions in the politics of the everyday life of these food networks, also the institutional institutionalization of these, the relation they have with the government, with the market, and who are also the people who are supporting these networks are part of this. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and those uh, not just supporting, but also interacting in this and intersectional inequalities can still remain intact without changing it. It depends very much on what perspective they have. But this is just a very little comment also from my side, which, which is extremely, I think also important to keep in mind. So now, um, I would like to open the floor to the, the uh, audience and we already do have two questions in the chat. However, um, what I would like to um, ask you is to just um, uh, put a little plus or a star into the chat and then you can also talk um, to, the, uh, to the audience and ask your question directly. I don't know whether those who already posed a question would like to talk to the audience and repeat the question again. I have to scroll up. There, there is one question by Taibach. Um, uh, to, uh, for uh, for Mai and asks um, asking so how is clean uh, how clean is your en clean energy given the ugly story behind the, behind the nickel mines as we know biodiesel also have horrible agrarian conflicts behind those huge MNC palm plantations especially here in Indonesia so this is one question and the second one is a longer comment and I would like to ask. Um, um, Javiera, to correct me if I'm wrong with uh, the way how I understood your your question, which is um, you are saying in the comment that there are already some alternative ways of producing food, and uh, you would like to ask um, the presenters whether uh, this really um, helps or whether th these new forms of production destroy local economies. Right? Did I did I get it right? So please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, these are the two questions. Do we have other comments? If not, I would first ask the presenters to relate to these questions and afterwards you can go on with your questions. Any other comments or questions here? Not so far. So my, I would like to ask you to, to answer the first question. I think first question is for Annie, no? Is it? No, it was you because it was uh, the, it was a mistake. Uh -huh. You know, is she she's um, you know it was on the uh, energy, and then yeah. Javier, Javiera Rosa would like to also speak, but but maybe you can first um, answer to that question. Um, because I actually uh, I'm not talk about the um, clean energy. I mean, the story behind it all is uh, is dirty energy. Mm -hmm. um, and also, yeah, I think uh, the question is also uh, what you call it, pointing about the uh, biodiesel from uh, uh, oil palm plantation, which is also have uh, uh, extremely many problems in Indonesia. So um, I actually uh, confused to answer the questions about um, so how clean in your uh, clean energy? Um, at the moment in Indonesia, um, the clean energy, uh, well, 80% of, of, um, of energy in Indonesia is, is uh, 
fossil fuels, um, most of it from coal. So I think you cannot call that um, a clean energy. Uh, even uh, when I relate with the, for example, how we think about renewable energy, and at the moment um, also how renewable energy, it still need uh, um, lithium battery. Um, I don't know, I think it's important maybe that, maybe it's more honest if we not call it um, renewable energy. I think it's important because part of it, um, it's still, uh, it's like when you call re renewable energy, it's like you pack, everything is fine and clear. That's my presentation about actually. Um, so is is there is uh, uh, the consequence uh, behind everything we call renewable, we call uh, a green, for example, which is um, there is uh, by that we can see how the power relation that's uh, uh, between you know um, global north and global south between rich farmer and then a poor farmer and even state and the, and the uh, people, for example. I hope it answers um, the question. Thank you very much, Mai. So, uh, Javiera, would you like to um, talk now? Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Um, uh, yes, I, I really enjoyed the conversation and especially to listen to the presentation. And, and I just have um, kind of words uh, playing in my mind. Um, I'm from uh, Papua province um, and I originally from Merauke. Uh, my indigenous territory was is still in a conflict uh, policy kind of interest between the Indonesian government, uh, food project planning uh, and uh, with the indigenous people's uh, rights to their land. So I just want to nail it with uh, with the topic today is about food, because um, as we understand that, as an as an indigenous people of the land, we we have the food security systems already uh, or food chain system, but since the new policies came uh, with the label of uh, food security as well, then it changed everything. So when we look at, at the the two world, uh, the the word alternative itself. If we play it as a as a you know alter and native, it's actually alternative is change the native kind of systems that already exist. And sometimes when we talk about alternative, when it comes from the big uh, from the policies of the government in agriculture systems, sometimes it changes a lot of things that already owned by indigenous peoples or native people. Uh, for example, in, in terms of the agricultural or farming systems, it changed. They introduced new technology, new uh, knowledge that is uh, really make people need to learn and change the methods, change the models, change the, change the way they farming. So sometimes uh, in, I think when we talk about alternative, we also really uh, need to look at uh, for who alternatives uh, mean, just like uh, Mai was mentioned before, that we have to really need to consider about that. What, what kind of alternative and for who? For example, alternative for people live in the city, like in Jakarta, uh, which was uh, in Patrick and Dima's research, that's probably different from people in Kalimantan or in other area, like in my, my place. So I think, when we talk about food system, food security, we can't really uh, separate from the policies and perspective of the government uh, development perspective. Because if we started to look at the big scale, massive production of food, as Marlene mentioned before, then we have to really look at the capitalism's work here and it's really disadvantaged people, especially people like indigenous communities or native people. So I think uh, food security is important, food, but we also, an alternative is important, but alternative based on the needs of people directly. So it's not based on, you know, it's not like a bigger concept, but it should be uh, come from the, the basic needs of people who are 
affected by food security. So in some place, maybe the case is different. So uh, I just want to add that uh, point in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments? Anyone? No one? So, and from the presenters, any, any last comment you would like to relate to or? Yeah. Everyone happy, huh? Maybe you might want to like Dimas, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Why Pato, and Pato. Pato and Dimas, okay. okay. Yeah, please. I have to switch my light. <laughs> ah, there is light. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi, Pato. Nice to see Hi. you. <laughs> nice to see you too, you dear Gulai. Oh, thank you so much for these presentations today and your moderation. So I learned also a lot. And I think that um, I liked very much this idea that putting into question what is alternative. And I think it was very good from uh, Maimuna, but also from Rosa, who were really discussing it from a more critical perspective, because in fact, not everything that is um, alternative or green is good for everybody. And uh, so I think this global perspective is really very important. And um, I loved very much um, Maimuna's presentation because you're right. If uh, the EU is looking for a green development, what does it mean? And what are the consequences for all these other countries who are bringing in either the services or are going to really uh, cover the needs of the global north, what are the consequences for the global south? So I think this is very important if we mm. talk about really alternatives or rethinking food. And of course, my approach would be to really broaden it. And I think that um, Malene was very close to um, my presentation yesterday because in fact, we need to look into the reproduction sphere. It's not about production only, but also about the preparation. And in fact, the whole communities will learn. And I think we have a lot of problems. On the one hand, we have these people who are undernourished. On the other one hand, we have the obesity problem, uh, which is all over because the way our nutritional um, systems have changed are really a challenge for our health system. Mm -hmm. And one key issue would be really whether people could come together because if you eat together, you have a social control. Whereas if everybody sits in front of the television or the computer, he can swallow things and it's not controlled. And probably also we will miss the enjoying and the narrative about our food system. So I said, even if it's not always the same criteria, we should come together and join our meal and also discuss it with vegetarians and others. So this I think is very important. And also um, one question from yesterday, I wanted to pick it up because it was the question, what about food sovereignty? And not every region in the world probably will be able to cover all its needs from the region. Um, and so local food is important. And of course, we should try uh, not to bring um, quinoa from one side or the avocado from the other side of the world uh, to the European countries to the global north, because they are really ruining all their ecological resources in these countries and also weakening the nutritional situation of the people. 
But mm -hmm. anyhow, I like very much your international perspectives and congratulations to Martina and to Gulai and all those students wonderfully have um, organized such a, such a good meeting. So I look forward to follow your uh, presentations for the next conferences. I'm very glad that you are still also working all in this field of nutrition and meals. I think would be helpful to to uh, keep up and uh, to have a new chance to to also reflect this into our alternative concepts. Thank you so much. I'm Thank glad. you. Thank you, Pato. So I have two last uh, comments. Dimas wanted to say something, and then I would directly hand over to Martina because we are anyway running out of time, and you see now how quick I can talk, right? But uh, as this is not so uh, complicated what I'm saying, I hope that's okay. Dimas, please, very, very yeah, briefly. I will just spend uh, one minute to make my point. Yeah, thank you very much to Javier Rosa for your uh, perspective. I think uh, what I would like to point out is that, you know, when we, when we it means, you know, like the panelists speak about uh, alternative, of course it comes from a particular place, right? So, you know, I grew up in city. I didn't do any, agri any kind of agriculture until my research. So, and of course, as you know, that the kind of the contemporary, like the modern history of, or like the history of Indonesia after independence, was shaped by the process in which rice became staple food, right? And of course, at that time, in many contexts, rice was alternative to local food, right? But of course, you know, it has many uh, negative impacts. Then I think, yeah, I just want to point out, yeah, is this very, I think, yeah, you, you make like really important points in thinking about alternative, because, you know, we also need to think about our own positionality, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Martina, it's now your turn. Yeah, thank you very much for these beautiful presentations. It was wonderful to listen to and imagine the all possible conversations emerging out of this and um, the different cases speaking to each other. What just struck me that what Marlene pointed also out that um, there's this tension about maintaining um, capitalist mo modes of exchange, but then is is there is there a world beyond that logic? And if yes, so what if how do alternative networks look like? Maybe um, um, yeah, monetary ca capital in the sense of money is not that important, but social and human capital seem to be coming to the forefront. Maybe we need to frame it differently as a relation, but nevertheless, I think we need to really question ourselves on these issues of inclusivity and exclusivity as they are not innocent as, at all. So many beautiful cases, even more questions, and I'm very happy to dwell on them together with you and with the wider network of WeGo and the University of Passau and also all students concerned with the Sustainability Week take, um, join us today. Um, without further ado, I would like to change, thank everybody, also the interpreters behind the scenes, Cleo for running um, the technicalities, um, everybody joining here. And I would like to um, point that we are not, this is just the beginning actually. This was the very first round of, um, Feminist political, feminist political ecology dialogue on food alternatives here at the University of Passau. But WeGo is a wide network and we are, I'm so happy to announce um, more, more um, dialogues to come and I'm trying to share now. Am I sharing? No. Okay, I need to press this button. No, what was this? I'm trying to, let me, it is a bit embarrassing, but let me try to share this. Maybe you look at my presentation screen, maybe you look at the proper one, 
Anyway, what the point is, there are other FPE dialogues coming up in the Netherlands, focusing on gender and environment, and it's met, how it matters for sustainability. We will move virtually to Spain to look at redefining the livable city through a FPE lens. And last, and we'll also join the UK FPE dialogue ne next to the uh, COP event at the UN Climate Change Conference to um, insist on climate justice. And last but not least, we'll move to Italy and look into weaving FPE ecologies. So I'm very much looking forward and we'll keep you informed. Please um, switch to the consult the WeGo website, consult um, our website at the University of Passau. And I'm very much looking forward to see you again and hopefully also meet in person um, sooner or later to engage in the further conversation. And we are really happy also to receive your feedback. And Cleo will again share this um, the link. Um, you can also share in English or Indonesian, whatever you prefer. Just click on the link to the Google Doc form and we are really happy to um, engage with you. You may also leave your um, contact details so that we can continue this dialogue. And um, there will definitely be one follow up in autumn where we want to also engage with our local beloved um, um, community supported agriculture, but this will be announced um, properly. So thanks a lot for joining us um, for spending intensive exchanges and especially uh, thanks to our chair Gulai and to all the intensive research work done by um, these beautiful gifted young researchers. So thank you very much. And thanks also for Patu joining us yesterday with their beautiful input. And I think this also underlines the intergenerational aspect of this emerging Vigo network. And you're also welcome to really have a look at the Vigo network page and register so that you keep in touch and become part of Vigo. So thanks a lot and see you soon. Bye bye.